What's everyone? John and Travis here with another fantastic episode of Elbows Type Podcast. John, how was that? Man, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, we had James O'Connor on. Um, seemed like a nice guy. He had a lot of great advice, and I like some of his inspirational quotes. Yeah, I thought this interview was really good. If you guys are struggling with motivation or mindset or just all around like self improvement kind of thing, James James is great at at explaining how to get better at just jujitsu life and stuff like that. Um, also, his insight into teaching teaching kids. I thought his stuff about kids was was great. Yeah, I did too. I like um, that Spidey sense. Spidey sense, right? Uh, and then we kind of go a little bit into the business aspect of it and how he runs his business too. I, I've, I've been wanting to ask people how they run their business a little bit lately. So that, w- that was cool to hear how he does it and the problems with <laughs> getting adults to come do jujitsu right. apparently is a pretty common thing. So um, what else did we kind of cover, John? Uh, I think you hit most of it on the head. Um, if you don't know who Tony Robbins is, you might want to Google that before you listen yeah, to it. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Self-motivator uh, or self-motivator, motivational speaker. Um and a business guy also, but James does a great job. He's his answers were fantastic. I've had a blast. Um, really made me think about some things too. So hopefully you guys feel the same way when you when you listen to it. So John, what's our beverage of the day? Uh, we had a good old fashioned course banquet beer. Banquet beer. It was pretty good. Haven't had one in probably twenty years. Yeah, it was delicious. If you guys don't drink course banquet. Mm, you're messing up. This stuff is delicious. It is a whopping, what's the alcohol content? 98% water, 98% 2% alcohol. Water. I, I, I'm not even anywhere close to being drunk. I feel actually more hydrated after drinking yeah, this. So, yeah, But sure. also, housekeeping things, uh, beverage of the day is Coors Banquet. If you guys want a patch, please let us know. Uh, our P.O. box will be down in the description below. If you want to send us one of your patches, we will send you a patch for free. Voila! So if you guys want to do that, just let us know. Good Christmas gift. Great Christmas gift. Uh, also, be on the lookout for our YouTube stuff. We have more YouTube content coming out. Uh, check us out, Elbows Tight Podcast everywhere, Elbows Tight Pod on Instagram, and ElbowsTight.com. I think that's pretty much it. And all of James's uh, information for his social media will be down below. So hopefully you guys go check him out too. He posts a lot of great stuff. Celebrate the almost. Okay? Just remember that. You know, context in the episode. So, John, we got anything else? Nope, that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching, and hopefully you guys enjoy this episode. We'll catch you later. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Elbows Type Podcast. It's your host, Travis and John. John, how you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, man. How you doing? Not bad. Can't complain. This is take number two. So far, technology has not been our friends for this podcast. <laughs> But today's guest, we have uh, James O'Connor. James, how you doing today, man? Fantastic. How are you guys? Oh, a whole lot better now that I heard the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, before we go any further, let's go ahead and uh, jump into your beverage of the day. Do you got a beverage of the day? Just water. Pretty, water. pretty plain Jane. Oh, I like it, though. It's vital. It's, it is vital. I've been drinking a lot more water lately, actually. I've been doing about a gallon a day. And I can notice a huge difference. I'm not even lying. Like, sleeping's better. Everything's better on my end. Um, how much water do you drink a day, John? Uh, right now, a lot. Because, you know, i got to take all these painkillers. And for some reason, a day just make me really thirsty. Yeah. James, quick question about water. Some people like to disagree about this. But do you think certain water has a certain taste? Like, bo- certain bottled waters have their own distinct taste. Do you think so? or? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, I try to talk to people about this, and I'm like, Arrowhead water is disgusting. It tastes like horrible, horrible water. And they're like, how can you say water has a taste? I was like, how could you not say water has a oh, taste? Oh, yeah, 100%. That's why, like, what is it, Fiji water? is That's like, my favorite. Yeah? I thought you were going to say, do you prefer tap or bottled water? Oh, that's a good one. Do you prefer tapped or bottled water? You know what? I Tap, because I feel like bottled water is not healthy. <laughs> it's very true. Very true. I, I just don't like paying for anything that it is yeah. like, I mean, are they really filtering it or yeah, is it just right? going right into a bottle? You know? Funny story. I'm, I'm originally from Las Vegas and in Vegas, we don't drink tap water because it's like super hard mineral water, like dries your skin out, doesn't taste good at all. When I first moved up to Washington State where John and I live now, um, 
I saw my girlfriend drinking at the time. She was my girlfriend, my wife drinking tap water. I was like, what are you doing? Like, that is disgusting. She's like, it's just tap water. It tastes good. I tried it. Legit tastes like bottled water up here. It is delicious. It is. But enough about the water. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jace, how about you go ahead and just introduce yourself? You're actually, it's really hard to find information about you out there. It looks like you do, you're a black belt in Taekwondo, third degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and you've been doing martial arts for about 20 years from what I understand. Man, almost 30 years now, yeah. Yeah, so go so, ahead and get, give us a little bit of a background on who you are and how you got into martial arts and jiu-jitsu. Yeah, so I, you know, I can't, just a classic story. I got bullied in school. My mom threw me in martial arts when I was about 12 years old. And uh, it was Taekwondo. I absolutely fell in love with it. I sucked at everything before that. I was <laughs> out of shape. I couldn't, I tell my students now, I couldn't run around a quarter mile track without stopping. I was in such just, just horrible shape. And uh, so the thing I love about martial arts, it really inspired my fitness because it made me want to be a better, stronger, faster athlete. So uh, my love of the martial arts was like side effects. It made me a much better, uh, just, you know, human being overall, but man, just a, a much better athlete. And then uh, kind of flash forward a year or two in 93 when Hoist Gracie came in and uh, took a bunch of people down and I couldn't believe it. I'm sitting there because I do Taekwondo. Right, so, right. Hick him in the head. I don't get it. <laughs> Just kick him in the head. So by UFC 3, I kind of gave in. And uh, I, I started cross-training. And uh, in the 90s, I was a sophomore in high school. I did my first MMA fight. Oh, so wow. I did 12, 12 MMA fights throughout my tween, teens and early 20s. And then uh, I went to Brazil in 2003 at Brazilian top team. Mario Sperry was there. Murilo, Murilo Bust, Bustamante. uh Arona, just a bunch of top level guys were there during the pride days. So, uh, 03, 04, I was training there and just, that's when I really fell in love with like the gi and jujitsu. So, uh, when I came back to the States in my head, I was going to be an MMA fighter, but I sort of reframed after being down there and I was, you, you know, uh, I, I just, I, I wanted to be more of a business owner. I wanted to continue training, but I really wanted my own academy. So, um, and that's, that's all I've ever done since I was 12 years old. It's like, I knew the martial arts was for me. I've never worked another job. I've never done anything. So for the last 30 years, it's just teaching and training. <laughs> that's, that's all I've ever done. When you started Taekwondo before you did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, did you think Taekwondo was like the superior martial arts? And like, do you still kind of hold it in a high regard today? Or does he, maybe he still thinks it is. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. that's why. Yeah. Well, so I think it could be applied. So during my MMA days, I've had I had I did twelve fights. Three of them I got knockouts with head kicks, and one hundred percent it's because of Taekwondo training. You know what I mean? So I I was able to apply it. You know, thankfully, and it wasn't me getting knocked out. But uh, so I, I uh, yeah, it's a tough question. Clearly, I don't think it's superior, but uh, I think you could probably take any martial art, and if you invest enough time into parts of it, you can come out on top. And if if you can apply it, you know what I mean. And do really well with it. Well, I think that's why we say MMA is probably superior at this point because yeah. it's all of them, you know? Like, there's there's right. no gaps there. Yeah, my son was just asking uh, a couple weeks ago about MMA. He's like, what is MMA? I was like, it's mixed martial arts. He's like, yes, but what? like, what is it? I was like, it's a mixture of martial arts. Like, I'm trying to explain <laughs> to him. He's like, but is it jiu-jitsu? Is it taekwondo? What is it? I was like, it's all of it, man. <laughs> like Striking, like it's, it's grappling. Striking. It, it's, all, it's all part of it. And it was like a hard concept for him to understand because he does Brazilian jiu-jitsu with us. And so he's like, but is it jiu-jitsu? I was like, well, it has aspects of jiu-jitsu in it. And Joe Rogan talks about Taekwondo a lot, too. And he talks right. about how, you know, jiu-jitsu is great, but you got to know striking. You got to know something on the feet. And, taek and he, he credits Taekwondo to having a great stand-up also. But one thing that uh, people talk about a lot is why jiu-jitsu – why jujitsu practitioners are so good at jujitsu usually when it comes to actually using it in person, like in application is because we spar, right? We actually, we apply application every class. Do you think that's a downfall of Taekwondo? How there, there is no actual, well, I can't say there is no actual, there is, but, but, but like, do you think Taekwondo could go further if it had more like live sparring in the curriculum? Well, there are, and it depends on the Taekwondo school you go to. If you look at Olympic Taekwondo, they're sparring all the time. In fact, they're probably sparring hard. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're training hard. But uh, what I think it's lacking is it's not teaching the – so, I, you know, the original MMA was Jeet Kune Do, what Bruce Lee developed, I would say. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he, he talked about four fighting ranges. 
And if you look at any boxing match, you can't watch a boxing match without the clinch range where they where they clinch up. So to me, like that's that's the power of jujitsu. You can't even watch two boxers that only want to punch each other. You, you they can't avoid the clinch. You know what I mean? So the chances of you avoiding a clinch in a fight ever are pretty slim if professional boxers can't, right? So then backing up to like Taekwondo, how could they make a more superior martial art? Well, they would have to cross train some of the other four ranges and discover like, okay, hey, you're going to get stuck and taken down here. How do we avoid that? Which then inevitably you have to train wrestling, sprawling. Uh, it, all, it, it all goes full circle. You're going to have to just know all of it, you know, to some degree. So if you were to raise the ultimate fighter, would you have them start in a grappling or would you have them start in a striking? That's a tough I, I don't know if I can pick one. <laughs> That's so tough. It is. I mean, I it is, right? I, what I think is wrestlers, when, the, when wrestlers train early on as children, I think they have this aggressiveness that I don't know if you can develop later on in your training in life. You know what I mean? So I'd almost say maybe if we get, you know, throw them in a wrestling program and just, just get that grinding, not giving up, kind of, whatever you would call that. Get that grit. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> develop that and then everything else is easy. So yeah. for, I would say wrestling, grappling. Yeah, I agree because when you first learn wrestling, it's we talk about it all the time, especially when you when you do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and you, you could tell the difference between someone that has a wrestling background, right? Because they're like one hundred and ten percent, and you can't teach that. That's like well, you you can in a sense, but they have to like grow into it. You have to have the atmosphere in it, and like wrestling practice was. All right, let's go. You know what I mean? Like there's there's no hold back. You know, don't don't destroy your your teammate, but you're trying to win even in practice. And I think that is such a valuable thing because right. takedowns, especially in jujitsu, I was listening to a podcast the other day and the guy was talking about like, you could be a world champion jujitsu and not know a single takedown, right? Like you can literally just pull guard the entire time and become a world champ. Do you feel that takedowns are an aspect of jujitsu that is kind of lacking right now going into that whole like wrestling aspect? I, I think it depends on the, the athlete, the style. Because if you're looking at ADCC, I think you see a lot of quality wrestling. Yeah, for example. absolutely. If you look, if you look at IBJJF, it's it's a toss up, man. I don't know, like like the Meows, for example, classic guard players. You know, I I, I would be surprised if they couldn't do a, a really good double leg though. At the same time, people think they're guard players, and that's maybe that's all they are. But I, I'd be surprised. I mean, they're athletic enough. They're they're well versed enough that they choose to play guard, but I don't think they don't know how to take somebody down. It's just you're looking at the apex, the highest level, that slimmest little lane that they stay in to to play their game. So, um, you know, it, it's really hard to say. Like, it, I, I almost think it's not fair to say. <laughs> That's good. Good answer. Good answer. I'm not going to create any enemies off that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that you have a lot of tape online from from competing. When you first started in jiu-jitsu, was it you wanted to compete from day one, or was it something you kind of grew into? Yeah, you know what? I uh, That's a good – like the guys that I that I started training with started competing, so I think you sort of naturally gravitate towards like what your team would do. So I, I did some competitions, not a whole lot. And I still – you know, from white all the way to black belt – um, I mean, I've competed at every level and, and I still intend to, it's, uh, but it's not a huge emphasis of mine, to be honest. So you've competed from all the way from white to black. What was the hardest belt to compete at? They're all hard. <laughs> <laughs> they all suck to some degree. It's like, you, you know, if you're a white belt, like you have good days and bad days and the same as a black belt. It's, I, uh, I, I've been surprised as a black belt. Like I've had uh some matches where i'm like oh you know i feel like i'm on their level and then other matches where i'm like i don't really i shouldn't be wearing a black belt <laughs> you know apparently <laughs> so it's uh it's it's interesting <laughs> so i was wondering is it like psychologically harder the higher the belt you know what i mean oh that's a good question yeah do you like put more weight on yourself now that you're a black belt when you when you compete because you feel like you have like a certain level that you should know and when you go against that harder person like you just mentioned you're like Man, what am I? Am I? What am I doing? You know, do you have that kind of mindset when you're competing now? Uh, I don't know. It's not any harder because, like, the thing is, like, if I if I'm a black belt and I lose to a blue belt, like, <laughs> that would look bad, right? If you're at Naga, right, you right, match with the blue belt and you lose, right? That's a lot of weight. <laughs> I mean, Nikki Rodriguez is destroying a lot of black belts, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So 
Uh, but if I lose to another, in my head, like if I lose to another black belt, they're a black belt, man. Like anything, I don't know. That's the way it should be, right? I mean, I, I don't know. It could go either way. So when when one thing that John and I talk about a lot is like when we roll with a, a black belt is the how hard should you go with them or should can you, I wrist lock them? Can you wrist that, lock is them? Is that offensive? Right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like when you're rolling with a, a lower belt, what? What are you? What is your mindset when you roll with them? Are you expecting them to go a hundred percent? Are are you going to feed them things to have them tap you, or kind of like what is your mindset when you're rolling with the lower belt? That's a great question. It, it just depends on who they are and what mode of training I'm in. I don't care. You guys can go as hard as you want with me. Just don't be like spazzy and elbowing me. Right. Like that's my only expectation. Is like go for it. Like grab a Kamara hard. That's fine, but be respectful of my body because this is the only one I get. You know what I mean? And I would be respectful of you too. So to me, I don't mind going hard at all as long as there's respect in there, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where even as we're, we're both blue belts and that it kind of goes to the same with us, even when we roll with uh, other blue belts or whatever, even a higher belt, it's like, like as long as we have that mutual respect to where someone's not ripping on something or, right. you know, being too rough. Like I was rolling with someone last night and they had me in the head and arm choke and it wasn't anywhere close. It was like literally shoulder into my nose and they just like were cranking on it. And I was like, man, I was like, I don't want to tap because like, it's not really doing anything, but this is so uncomfortable. And how do they not feel that this right. is, like isn't there? Have you, you've experienced that quite a bit, I bet too, huh? Yeah. You know what? I will say though, that will stop happening to you if, if the technique's not clean in general, you're going to start learning how to avoid that. So if it's here, you're, that's enough room for you to get out if your right. defense is good. So unless the only time it happens is like I'm 170 and they're like 250 and just muscular. And I literally, even my defense doesn't work, you know? So, uh, so yeah, I, I know what you mean. It gets better <laughs> when you're similar in size, trust me, unless they outweigh you by a ton, then I don't know. I don't have an answer at that point. Now, see, I found I'm always too timid when I roll with new black belts, like new ones that we roll yeah. with, right? So I'll be like super timid the first roll because I don't want to be like the guy that comes off as an asshole that's rolling too hard and too offensive. But after the first one, when I get cleaned for five minutes, I'm like, that's it. The next time we roll, I'm rolling a lot harder. <laughs> and then you just get cleaned up even more. Yeah, yeah. Five and I was like, all right, maybe that didn't work either. <laughs> John, John isn't that weird though your mindset yeah, like for sure we're all agreeing on the mats to this mutual combat yeah. you know with rules we're all agreeing to it but then in your head the relationship with you and that black belt is just a little bit different than probably what's going on in his head oh for sure and we're all aren't we just such weird mind creatures it's funny it's true though it's like even when uh when you we met we talked about this uh, a couple times where even when you have like a blue belt and you walk into a room full of white belts, the mindset of everyone else as they as you put on that blue belt or purple belt or whatever it is is like, oh, now I'm gonna go for that guy. You know what I mean? Like it's so <laughs> weird how we how we have this uh, representation of our the color of our belt or this respect of it, and then it like messes with our psyche so much sometimes to the point where what. Well, yeah, I mean, there's. I don't know if I've ever been close to tapping my professor, but there's definitely been times where I was like, I don't know if I should go for that or not. You know, what would you tell people when they have that mindset in rolling? Just, just go for it. Well, now I do know certain black belts that have pretty large egos. I'll be honest. So I would hate to make a blanket statement, and you have that prof not you guys, but someone out there has that professor that has a big ego, and you go for it, and all of a sudden someone's feelings are hurt and something bad happens. So. All I can speak is to me, if you roll with me, bring it, just be respectful. I'm a black belt. I'll go hard with you. You can go hard with me. I'll have a bad day and I'll tap or you'll have an awesome day and like you still tap me. That's fine. But uh, that, that's the only experience I can really speak on. The real cool black belts out there, just be nice, be respectful and go, you, you can go hard. I've never heard of anyone having a challenge. Yeah, John, you had an experience where someone thought you were going harder and they blew up on you mid-roll. Which which one? Mm. Which one was in that? Japan? Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. So how do you handle that situation? Like, say if say you're you're teaching a class and you see two students and they're like going at each other, like one felt like he didn't release fast enough or went too hard mid roll. Like, how do you defuse that situation so it doesn't escalate, or do you let it escalate? <laughs> so oh, again, maybe <laughs> we have a really close knit tribe here. I've had a couple instances like that here. We're all adults. We're all men that are in the room at the time. Honestly, I sort of let it handle itself. I didn't feel like I needed to interfere because it. They uh, a couple times it happened. It, it sort of worked itself out. Now that being said, I would I wouldn't let anybody get harmed either. You know, in front of me. 
Um, so again, it's a, it's a tricky circumstantial thing. I, I, I think, of course, uh, I, I just don't have, I really don't have a lot of that though. Like anyone coming close to hurting people a lot or, um, you know, some gyms have that one guy that tends to hurt people over and oh, over. Yeah. Yeah. I've had them want to come to my school and I, I don't, I don't invite them. They ask me about a class and I'll be like, nope, we don't have class then. <laughs> <laughs> but on your but schedule. No, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, know, I just yeah. don't know. I don't want to roll. Like, now I'm like, they're yeah. like, you want to roll? I'm like, no, I'm good. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm good. That, I definitely feel like that's that more people could say no to rolling, especially if you know the person's a hard roll. Like if someone come to find out when I was a white belt, uh, I went too hard. I didn't know this because people still rolled with me and no one really told me, you know what I mean? And I was right. like, I was like, man, like, and, and when I started having it brought up to me, I was I was like I would start roles with people like, hey, let me know if there's a point where it's too hard because I don't know what I what is too hard to you for me. Like I'm just yeah. going right. What was what was white belt James like though? You know, I was always kind of the, one of the smallest training partners in the room to be honest. So uh, we had again we had a pretty good tight knit group. There wasn't really anybody that was too hard the thing with that is like when you tell somebody let me know if i'm going too hard you're asking them to do something that's very uncomfortable yeah you're asking me to submit to you in that moment saying hey i need you to go easier on me i'm submitting to you without tapping yeah you know what i mean so no, I so therein lies that. the challenge that's too me. it's like how do you address that i don't want to tell you i'm a man you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, yeah. i don't want to look at you and be like hey bro you're going a little too hard on me like i don't want to say that so it, 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 that's, it's a hard thing. So really, I think it needs to come down to the culture of your school, which all starts at leadership. It's at the top, the professor, the coach. So it really needs to come from there. Coming from Taekwondo, were you spazzy or were you kind of timid? Because I know there's a lot of people when they first get into jujitsu, either they're timid or they're, they, they go for it. Like they're like every, every fight is a fight for their life. Yeah, I was probably, I was probably more timid. I definitely wasn't the... I, I'm sure I was spazzy, but I wasn't the like all out super aggressive. I would pull guard, I would hold. I was like just very defensive. So who did you start? That was me. Who did you start training under? By the way, I didn't think we. I don't think we heard that. Yeah. So my my taekwondo like the school I I taught at brought in an instructor. His name is Patrick Robinson, and this is back in the '90s. Okay, so I live in Northwest Indiana. Chicago is a close city. There was a blue belt in Chicago. Okay, that was like the highest rank right and uh so patrick robinson would go cross train and then kind of bring it back to the area and i was actually a pretty similar size to him by the time i was like in eighth grade so he sort of kind of took me under his wing a little bit and we do like a lot of private training he eventually opened a school and i would just cross train in my taekwondo school and then be with him and i eventually got my black belt under him you run the free brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, techniques and what what is the title? Uh, skills and drills. Skills yeah. and drills. That's it. Yeah, right uh, on Facebook. If you guys are in that group, uh, James is one of the admins. And then also you put out a lot of like informational, motivational, motivational uh, stuff out there. What what made you want to start doing all that kind of stuff? You know, I don't know. So sixth grade me, sixth grade James, I found a cassette tape. You know, Tony Robbins is mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> so it, my my stepdad had like uh 30 days to power i forget the name of it right and walkman you know what a walkman yeah, is. <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> i'd be on sixth grade and i don't know why i'd pop in tony robbins cassette tapes right so from that early age i just got hooked on like uh you know self-development positive uh motivating you, you know call them what you will like motivators and, and self-help gurus I absolutely clung to that. And I've always like, I, I just love how they made you feel. You know what I mean? Yeah. They didn't change your life in any, like, uh, I, I'm not a millionaire because of it. You know I mean, I, it's none of these things, but it's like that daily conditioning, that, that process that it, it makes you look through a different, different lens. So when other people are being pessimistic and this sucks, that sucks. Now, I'm not like that. You know what I mean? I've, I've truly been conditioned to not only like look for the highest, best, um, situation or, uh, I'm looking truly for solutions too, I guess. It's not just like this happy put on fake lenses, right? So because that, that's been my personality for so long, I just uh, I, I want to invoke that type of emotion in other people and relate to them. And I see everybody in jiu-jitsu, white belt, blue belt, and I was there too. They just, you, you get down, man. This art is hard. I was thinking about it today. I'm like, what other thing do adults do that are our 
age state from 20s to 40s to 50s. Like, what else do they do to develop themselves? We're not used to this. That's we true. don't, right? Right. I mean, podcasting is one big thing, though, right? Well, it's funny because I, I think we were kind of like the same way a couple years ago. Like, we were looking for people that were going through the same stuff we we're going through, starting off jujitsu. Like, man, there's nothing. I'd search and it's like, you know, high level black belts that we couldn't really relate to at the time. So, we needed something more for white belts, blue belts. And, you know, it's good when you can go out there and you can get that positive mental outlook by hearing other people going, their experiences with it. And, and to be honest, like the criticism when I when I throw those posts out, it's interesting. Like the criticism I get back, um, it's mostly from the higher level guys that like can't relate to being a white or blue belt again. Yeah, yep. They're like, hey, bro, what do you mean quit? Just stick with it. Or like they just put out these things. I'm like, you know what? Like I still have those days, man. I've been trying. Yeah. I've been for 20 years. I've been doing jujitsu. I still sometimes like leave the academy, drive home, and be like, I don't know jujitsu. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, just, you have a bad day. You don't think you understand things. So I just, I, I, I want to connect with people. I want to let them know, like, I, I've been there. I am there. I'm like you. You're like me. Like, we're going to all make it together. Don't worry. Just don't quit. Just keep, just keep showing up. Yeah. And it kind of plays into that whole blue belt blues thing, right? Like people, people get that first belt. And uh, a lot of people we talk to say blue belt's your longest belt. Like it's, it's the one that, yeah, you get there, you can usually get there relatively quick, but it's usually the longest one to, to get to purple. And the, you know, people get demotivated and they're like, oh man, I feel like I'm not learning. I'm plateauing, but really it's just this stigma we have in our own head that is saying like, I'm not doing good. And it's like, but but right. what are you referencing? Like you could kick your own butt six months ago or a year ago or or whatever. You know what I mean? And I feel like a lot of people don't see jujitsu that way. And, and I mean, we both go through it. Like, oh, for sure. I mean, we've been training, you know, for a couple of years now. And I, we got some people that maybe have been there for a year and they're tough, super tough roles now. They'll get me. I'm like, whatever. I'm 43. They're 20. <laughs> Like at some point, I know that they're going to pass me like it's just going to happen. But, you know, you're right. It In your 40s and 50s and 30s, I don't know many adults that keep doing what we're doing. Like, I just don't. Or do anything. Okay. Like what new skills do adults get? Or like, you know what I mean? They don't acquire new skills, I feel like. That's true. Yeah, and it, every every jujitsu class, whether I go over, we go over the same technique over and over again. I'm always learning something, and it's like, mm -hmm. oh man, especially when you apply it in in training, right? You're like, and you have a partner that can give you positive feedback or criticism and say, hey, you could have been a little bit tighter here or something like that, and then your mind just instantly, you know, it's like it's like Zach Galifianakis in Hangover. You're like crunching numbers, like, oh my god, how do I do this all over again? I thought I knew how to do that. Well, we we had a. Uh, our professor now came and he's a Carlson Gracie black belt and our school before wasn't under a Carlson Gracie guy and he came in and he started rolling with us and he straight was like man you guys don't know anything like you guys don't even know the basics like and I was like oh what like what do you mean I thought I was pretty good at jujitsu for a blue belt but he came in and first class all of us were just mind blown about like the way he was teaching and the technique and stuff like that and uh I think it's it can there's one or two ways we could take that, right? Is you could either take it as, man, I'm terrible or I'm hungry. You know what I mean? Right. And I feel like a lot of people nowadays are quick. Like you said, they're quick to be kind of pessimistic about it. They're kind of like, oh man, like I don't really know. Maybe I should stop doing jujitsu. How, how do you motivate people in your school to, to continue on? You know, uh, so, so like one of the things I wrote is comparison is a thief of joy. And I really try to keep that, keep that in my mind. Like you guys said, like who are you comparing yourself to? And it really, that it resonates. Cause it's like my 40 year old self would destroy my 20 year old self that was fighting in the ring. Mm. You know what I mean? I look back on that and not that I'm here to obviously fight myself, but, uh, but, but it's like, what is the, why are you doing this? Like I try to reframe people. Like, why are you doing this? Are you only doing this for a set amount of time to then quit? Oh, you mean you're going to do it forever? Is that what you're telling me? Okay, good. So let's keep doing this forever. Get your mind off of like why you suck in this moment because you're gonna it, it's a plateau. You're gonna go past it, and then guess what? You're gonna suck again. You have to get <laughs> you have to become like the best person at being okay with sucking in that plateau. Like if you're if you can be okay with that because you know you're gonna spike up again. That's it. You got it made. But if you're the one that like as soon as you hit that plateau, you're like oh, I want to quit. I suck. I'm not getting better. That that plateau I think is everything. The plateau is. <laughs> <laughs> you think losing sucks. It's like when you make no progress and you feel like you're here, I, I think that almost sucks equally. Yeah. And it's like, 
once again, kind of going back to it, like you just, you're, who are you comparing yourself to? Like, there's no, there's no reason to say like, like, yeah, you might, we might, we might not be exactly where we want to be, but it, it's a journey. You know, most people want to do this for life and to, we, we haven't had any blue belts quitting our school yet, luckily, but John, John's been pretty close. No, get out of here with that. <laughs> I'm I'm worried about this uh, probably a couple month layover I'm gonna have getting back on the mat. Yeah, I'm gonna be out of shape. John, yeah. John's had some pretty major surgeries yeah. in his in his jujitsu journey. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. And so this is the this is the the biggest one. But one thing that you that you posted today that I thought was freaking fantastic, and I kind of I want to dive a little bit deeper is this idea of celebrating the almost, like mm. embracing the almost, like. Instead of always us, from what I understand, right, is instead of always like staring at the goal and being focused on the goal, there's a journey to it that we we need to embrace too, right? Is that what you're kind of getting at when you were mentioning that? Yeah, because there's gonna be a day when you like you almost get your professor, like 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 legit, like it's not gonna be he was feeding you something, you know. I roll up all my students a lot, and they legit they catch me. You know what I mean? Even even some of the white belts, it's like. Uh, you know, are we going hundred percent? No, but like in that moment, like they truly caught me. I didn't want them to, and they got me and they should take that as a victory. Right. And there's going to be times leading up to that, that you're going to be with your coach and you're going to be like, you pass his guard and you'd be like, Oh, like I almost got there. I can feel him fighting. You know what I mean? And that victory is going to be so sweet. It's, it's as good as tapping him or getting his back. Cause it's like, you almost got him. That that's huge progress compared to like white belt you that, he could use like a foot, his right foot on, and you still couldn't pass his guard. Like just, you know what I mean? Defending himself with a foot. So those almost, we got to cling to what we, what we can too, in a positive way. I mean, that's progress. Yeah. And it's like, we try to tell people too, you know, set micro and macro goals, right? Like macro goal. I want to get my blue belt. Micro goal is I, I want to roll with so-and-so and not get them in, not have them get in mount or, I want to tap so-and-so or I don't want to get tapped by so-and-so, you know, and having those micro goals, uh, we, we're doing a video right now of, you know, tips for blue belt blues. And one thing we, we mentioned in it is setting, you know, goals, like whether big or small. And that way you have a something to set your, your focus on, whether big or small, because then you can stay focused. You can you be in the moment and be like, oh, man, this is this is a uh, this is what I'm aiming for. I remember the first time I didn't get tapped in the middle of a roll with our, our gym owner, Cody. I literally jumped up and celebrated. I was like, I didn't get tapped. <laughs> I still don't think I've met that one with him yet. <laughs> so, but when when a, a student comes to you and they, they mention they want to either do like MMA or they want to compete in jujitsu or uh, they want to get their blue belt or whatever in X amount of time, how, how do you receive that and what, what do you do to help them? Yeah, so uh, which one are we going with there? You you put out a bunch of them. <laughs> we'll say we'll say they want to compete. Say they want they want to compete. Yeah. It's like, do you give them honest feedback of, hey, maybe we should work a little bit on this, or are you kind of like, well, let's 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 start training and let's just go straight for it. That's that's another great question because even me, like sometimes I I sort of struggle with that. I'm like, when somebody asks me, I'm in my first instinct is to be like, you're not ready. Like, you know what I mean, <laughs> yeah. if I don't say that, but in my head, if I think that, I'm like, okay, James, pull back, man. There's someone out there that they could beat, though. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I've gone to a lot of tournaments, and I've seen some people win that I was surprised by. So, I, I like, I try to step back and go, okay, if you really want to compete, then here's what you're going to have to do. And we sort of lay out a game plan of, uh, of expectations I would have of them and uh, to see if they're willing to meet it, you know? Yeah, that's that's good because we have uh, a lot of people in our school that want to compete. And um, one thing that our professor recently said was, like, no one's, you, we're not training to be – world champions and that's okay like if you want to compete and have fun that's okay just that go and compete and have fun but if you want to be a world champ that takes something completely different and you got to have that <laughs> in your mind because it's not coming to practice once or twice a week it's <laughs> it's a whole lot more than right. that and one thing that you you mentioned too was consistency you know if you want to get better you have to be more consistent so what if life gets in the way of someone and they can't train as much as they should or they can't or you know they have kids or families like what should their mindset be for when they do go to class? Yeah, this is probably one of the top three questions that I, that I see asked and I get asked 
actually, I just like, I just wrote something about this. What I get a lot is from like law enforcement, for example, and they work some crazy shift and they want to do jujitsu, but they're like, man, I can, some weeks I'll only, I won't even make it a full week. Like I'll have to take a whole week off before I get back. And I'm like, bro, that's okay. Look right now as a police officer, you're getting eight hours of required training a year or something like that, depending on the department, eight hours a year. Right. And a lot of that training, let's, this isn't me saying it. It's officers going through it saying a lot of it is probably throwaway, oh, right? Yeah. I go, if you just came once a week consistently for 52 weeks, that's 52 hours a year, right? Compare that to another police officer that's only doing eight hours of DT, which isn't even like that hands-on live, like Brazilian jiu-jitsu feel. I go, man, 52 hours a week. How many people you know walking around the average person that's going to give you trouble when you pull them over? Some dude that's drunk. How many hours of training does he have under his belt. I guarantee it's not 52 hours. I guarantee it's probably not even eight hours. Right. So as just coming from like law enforcement, I try to remind them once a week, I know it seems like it's not much, but it adds up. It's totally worth it. And then if it's not law enforcement, like, why are you doing it? Is it for self-defense? 52 weeks, 52 hours a year, man. The average person that you would get in a fight in for whatever reason on black Friday, arguing over TV, I don't know why, <laughs> but you're going to be okay. If you have 52 hours of training against some dude in Walmart that wants a TV more than you, you know what I mean? You're going to be way more than okay. So it's about reframing it in your head. I, I know everyone wants to train more. Of course they do. Yeah. So you know, funny thing you mentioned is, you know, how much more training you have than other people. And my, my son in middle school, he actually just got in like a, a somewhat of a fight today with someone. And uh, I told him like, hey, self-control, like, you know, but if they hit you, don't, don't don't let someone, you know, take advantage right. of you, like do what you feel is necessary and know that you have training. So know when to stop also, you know what I mean? Like when you have a big kids program with like self-defense and things like that, how do you get them in the mindset of sticking up for themselves? Do you think that it just yeah, comes good. with just training and then being more confident with it? No, you know, it, it, it takes it's direction, man. Cause I have a, like my four five and six year old class. I teach them, I, it's so cute hearing them say it, but I have them like repeat after me. I say self-preservation, you know, and it comes out like a four-year-old would. <laughs> Super cute, right? <laughs> but, uh, but all the parents are there and they laugh. I go, but listen, you guys were all born with something just like every mammal on earth. It's to protect yourself. A deer protects itself by running. A cheetah may do it different. You're a human. You need to protect yourself. And I get that, that they're in their mind right away, self-preservation. So what does that mean? Well, sometimes it means running. We go through different circumstances and role-playing. Other times, someone's grabbing you. What do you do? You can't run away. And we go through self-defense moves. But, man, I get it in these little four-year-olds' minds that nobody is supposed to touch you, hurt you, abuse you. And I even go into, like, I light, I tread lightly on, but I'm like, even adults that you know at home and maybe their grandparents or if anybody makes you feel uncomfortable, that's never good. And I call it, like, their spidey sense, you know, <laughs> how, uh, like, spidey webs. I go, you were born with spidey senses. Listen to it the little hairs on the back of your neck or something doesn't feel right. You need to tell somebody you need to run out of there. But self-preservation is like my, my big key thing. I get them understanding is to keep yourself safe. So what is, what is your biggest uh, contributing factor to bringing new people into your school? Is it word of mouth or do you put a lot of like advertising out there or is your town small? Like do people just know who you are because of your school? Yeah, it's it's kind of nice because yeah, I've got like thirteen thousand people in, t in this town, so it's it's pretty it's rather small, you know. I live pretty close to Chicago, an hour away, which is a, a huge demographic. If I, if, you know, I, sometimes I think, man, if I had a school there, how much bigger would it be, you know? But uh, but luckily, it is it's it, it's like that like local celebrity in a way. I position myself because I'm constantly out there. I'm online. If you look at my TikTok, I've got three hundred fifty thousand followers. Like I, I'm just I'm out there like on everything as much as I can. And, uh, so like my kids programs, they just grow by themselves. Like people, I, I don't know if it's just people looking for activities for their kids. I'd like to think, you know, I have a good reputation too. People speak highly of the things I do here, but, uh, but yeah, the younger they are, the easier it is to grow adults Man, it's hard. It's hard to get adults in here training. They just, they don't want to do it for themselves for one reason or another. Yeah, our kids class is booming right now. Huge. I counted the other day. They easily had 40 something kids on the mat. Huge, and it's and our, our adult class is like eight, nine. <laughs> I'm like, I don't get it. I, I try to get my. They're like, oh, I got my back hurts, my leg hurts. It's like, oh. So how do you? We one thing that our school has done a couple times is have like uh, parent and uh, 
kid day where the parent comes and joins them in class and learns some technique with the kids and kind of builds that bond with them. Do you do anything like that, right. like a like a to bring the family in a little bit more? Um, so not with, I, I do and I don't like I, I do like my four, five, and six year olds. If we're doing self defense moves, I'll have the moms and dads come on the mats. And uh, I, I try to encourage them to train at home. And I'm like, hey, this is one way you guys can do it. It's uh, it, it does build the bond. I mean, I love seeing the parents interact with the kids. But I, that's like the sole purpose of it. It's not uh, necessarily. I know some, you know, some schools will do that to try to then get the parents to take a class, which is a great idea. I just, uh, I don't know. I don't implement that in that way. So for your kids' self defense class, is it? Is it a jiu-jitsu class or a taekwondo class, or is it a combination uh, of the two? It is. It's a combination. They're uh, at that at that age. They don't like they get rank, but it's not like an official rank. Like it wouldn't be uh, like at, a, at like seven. They they would have to start over in my taekwondo program as like a white belt, even though they've been training for two or three years, just because it's. Uh, gosh, I hate to say it's watered down, but at that age, they can't, the, their gross motor movements are so much different. You know what I mean? They, they don't have the fine motor movement of an eight year old. So the things I teach them hundred percent work, they're super basic, but at seven or eight, we definitely start getting into a more serious type of program. So they have to start over. Have you noticed, um, kids conditioning in classes? We had, uh, I watched a brand new kid at the kids class and man, they were just doing warm up. They were maybe five or six minutes into the warm up. He ran outside, started throwing up everywhere. And I talked yeah. to his mom and she was like, yeah, you know, he just plays games. This is his first time I managed to get him out here to do something. He's like 12, 13. And that was probably two and a half, three months ago. I've never seen him miss a kid's class after that. I was really wondering. I was like, I wonder if he's out after this. But I talked to him. I tell him like, you know, that's great that he showed up. He realized that he couldn't do anything. A light warm up and he was throwing up in five minutes. I was like, man. What, how do you treat your kids when they when they first show up into class? Um, if they're coming into a class with you know obviously more experienced people, do you do you have like a beginners class for them, or do you just kind of jump into class with us and you can kind of get it? Yeah, they just jump in, and I, I just I man, I've been teaching thirty years. I feel like I'm pretty good at uh, just figuring things out, like how, how to make things work so everyone's comfortable. So you don't have a beginner's class for your like brand new white belts in jujitsu either? Is it kind of just jump into class with us too? No. See, yeah, it's uh, see, because we have I've been to a school before where they had the blue belts run like the the beginner's course, and it, you know it helps the blue belts because it te makes them teach uh, the basics right. over and over again. And so it's always interesting to me that some school have it and some schools don't. You know what I mean? And I, I always want to understand the mentality behind whether you do or you don't, right? But if you if a school one, they can't, they can't just, they don't have enough people or instructors to do it. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to do a on ramp class. You know what I mean? But when you go to promoting people, do you, do you test or do you just give them the belt when you feel that they're ready? Yeah. The jujitsu, we don't do any testing. It's uh usually like at a seminar. My, uh, so Patrick Robinson promoted me to black belt. And then when I was ready for my first stripe, he wasn't able to give it to me. He wasn't because you have to be uh, – okay, I forget now. Do you have to be two stripes to give out a stripe? He wasn't at the rank. So I think you have to be two stripes to give out one stripe on a black belt. So there was another gentleman that we kind of hooked up with, Octavio Couteau. He uh, kind of stepped in, and since he's been promoting me for my stripes – and a lot of times just at a seminar, I have them in pretty frequently. So we do a lot of the promotions just at a seminar, like, like I think a lot of schools would. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm absolutely. all about that. We've, we tested, I mean, it's cool and all, but I feel like, uh, I don't know. It's just a lot of pressure when you know you have a test coming up and I'm horrible at that. So, I mean, I don't know. I'd much rather just roll for a year and then you can tell me if I get it or not. That's, that's great. We tested for our blue belt and it was like, you know, king of the hill, like people just passing through. They were like, literally like we're laying on the floor and like the line is starting yeah, right, it was right at our hips. You know what I mean? And it's like just one after another. And at first it was like, yeah. a, it felt like a rite of passage. Like I, I earned this kind of thing. And then the more right. people we talked to, the more I realized like, well, I mean, I could still feel like I earned it, even if it's just like, it's like my professor is saying like, here, you've, you've earned this. Like, this is, this is yours now, you know, cause do you feel like people get hung up on, especially going into blue belt? Do you feel like people get hung up on belts quite a bit in promotions? Like if people were being honest, I think they would just say, yeah, like 
that's another huge thing. People are like, it's not about the belt, bro. It's not kind of <laughs> like, and it's okay. I mean, it definitely is. If it's, it's been okay. a couple of years, if you're, you know, cause then you're like, maybe, maybe I just need to move on to something. I mean, maybe I'm just not progressing. Yeah. I, there's just so much stigma about it. I'm like, again, as an adult, we don't have much like this in our life that we like, we train for or like testing. Like you guys said, you didn't like testing, but I'm not, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it could be good because it, it gave you what it gave you like pressure. It gave you a sense of importance. It gave you nervousness, anxiety to deal with. These are good things to have to learn how to deal with. That's, oh, a, that's exactly what and, I told myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. I just got to do it since yeah. I don't like it. Now I need to get, get through it. Yeah. And I think it like it, it, you develop something in those moments. You know what I mean? Where it was like, right. like I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. There were, I yelled at my wife in the middle of it because I wanted water and she gave me like flavored miho. And I was like, I was like, I didn't want this. And I was like, cause that was in my eyes. I was like fighting for my life. And like in those moments, like I was expecting my wife to hand me nice cold water. If she's listening, she listens to the podcast. I'm still sorry about that to this day. It was so bad. Uh, I, she didn't even say congratulations to me yeah. after the class, like where I got my blue belt. And my wife was standing next to his wife with three plates of teriyaki for me. <laughs> But it, it like it like motivates. It was like a motivation. I was like, I know this isn't going to last right. forever. I know at the end of this, I'm gonna I'm gonna earn what you know what I'm working for right now. And it, I think the motivation aspect of the testing was probably right. like the biggest takeaway of it. Like I fought through it. You know, like I did it. Like it's like it made me feel good. You know what I mean? Like what motivates you the most in life right now? Yeah, you know, I, I read that on your question. I really had to like dig dig deep a little bit because I am so intrinsically motivated that uh, I I don't like if I need to look look to external sources. Okay, people are like into David Goggins or you know, you know they they flip that on YouTube, and I might do that. But man, I uh, I don't like to travel. I have no <laughs> desire to travel. I love my routine. Yeah. I love my. I wake up. I train every morning. And then I do my little routine. I go home. I, I hang with the kids. I train again in the afternoon. I get. I love my routine because I'm. I'm just. Uh, I don't know what it is. I've always been like that my entire life. I would wake up at five a.m. to lift weights before everyone got to the high school. Um, I've just always been intrinsically motivated. So for me, I, it doesn't. I don't. I don't know. I don't need motivation. You know, like some other people do. And it, it's again, it's not good or bad. I'm. I'm blessed. I'm just always. There's just the discipline is there. I just do it anyways. You don't you don't press the snooze button on the alarm clock at all. I mean that's that's like my. <laughs> now, I hate it, dude. Like I I put the alarm on and I have anxiety about it going. If it beats me to waking up, if that goes off before I wake up, I feel oh, agreed. 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 So I have anxiety. Agreed. Who weird. wakes up to an alarm? I don't wake up. I to woke alarm. up. My alarm goes off at three thirty in the morning because I, I go to work by five. And I woke up this morning at three o'clock and I was like, all right, cool. I beat my alarm. I'm just going to lay here for a second and just yeah. relax before I get out of bed. Then I woke up at three fifty. I was like, dang it, man. Like, <laughs> I should have just got up, man. Like, now I'm falling behind on my day. You know what I mean? So, but uh, we mentioned earlier about competing. Do you feel that competing, it kind of like the belt testing, you get the anxiety, you get the self growth from it and something you fight for, especially when you don't know the person. Do you think competing is important in jujitsu? Man, I, and that's another one I struggle with still. It's like when people ask, do you think your coach, would you go train with somebody that's never competed? And I mean, I would, I would like, I, I value people, but, uh, are you ever going to get somebody as good as if they, you know, they never stepped out and they never experienced those competitions? I, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like a competitor is always going to be at a higher level always. And I think they're understanding. So it's like one of those questions people would, like if I, if I had to go back and talk to my white belt self or do, do things different, I've always been obsessed with trying to think like insert whoever, Andre Galvao or Gordon Ryan. I'd rather think like them than be spoon fed their DVD yeah. of how you do an arm bar, how you do this or that. I want to like learn how to think like them conceptually or whatever that means. So, uh, so to me, it's like, uh, again, if your coach is really good at that and he's never competed, awesome that, that that's fantastic i i don't think it's wrong but uh i i think a competitor is always going to be at a higher level than somebody who hasn't so if you could pick it would make sense to go with the higher level guy do you think it holds more weight in belt promotions or not like how do you see if someone consistently competes and do you hold that in regards to 
if they should be promoted, like if they keep winning in local competitions. Right. Yeah. I mean, yes and no. I think, I think you just kind of know, like if they're, if they're winning at local competitions they're probably still like, you can feel them in the Academy. You're like, Oh, this guy, they might be a little special. You know what I mean? They're, they're training so much. Like, I think, you know, so I don't think it takes a competition. Now I do like think the sandbagging and some of those things, it's a real thing out there that uh, I'm not sure how that can be fixed, but you know, I, I look at some of the bigger schools and I'm like, their blue belts would destroy me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's frightening. And I'm like, that doesn't, I don't know if that's fair or not, but at the same time, those blue belts probably started when they were five, you know, under the best in the world. So that's a great segue (laughs) because, um, one thing that has been in the news in the jiu-jitsu community lately is like, uh, 18 year olds getting their blue belt or their black belt right when they turn 18. Do you think the age restrictions on belts is a good thing? Or do you think like if a 16 year old is like been doing it for 12 years, Right or has been doing it for ten years and they're they're at a black belt level because they've been doing it so long. Do you think that they should be able to get their black belt? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's hard to argue. Right, they shouldn't, that's the, right? that's a sandbagging. Right? Prime example of sandbagging. Right, right. And I, and I'm not trying to like call out any schools or or put names on it, but like I said, there are blue belts out there that would destroy me. That doesn't like I'm not the I'm not a world champion. You know what I mean? But at the same time, I still train hard. I'm I'm a black belt, and it shouldn't really be right i i I don't know so i i think rules and regulations are there as like parameters but i i think rules are sometimes meant to be broken you know in certain circumstances yeah and like uh there's i've recently i've been liking the submission underground and stuff like that too and one of the people that i didn't know this when i first heard about them mason fowler uh when i first heard about him i didn't even know that he he wasn't a black belt he's the welterweight champ in submission underground he's a brown belt and it's like like he's he's at like mm. the highest level s- submitting black belts left and right and you know defending his his title in submission underground and it had me thinking like well a belt doesn't rep doesn't doesn't stop you from you know competing and doing well and whatnot but if you're if you're a 16 year old blue belt in a like a, a a blue belt uh bracket with adults and you're like well i mean these guys have been doing it for two two three years it's kind of like dang dude this Maybe I should just stop. It's kind of like goes back to the like, do I know jujitsu? It's like, no, that guy right. just knows jujitsu. Like he's been doing it a very yeah, long right. time. So, but if you could give a piece of advice to a brand new white belt, what would it be? I think it's more important to spend time on learning uh, like concepts instead of like one trick move, one trick pony kind of stuff. So I'm really fully understanding a concept to me. I'm obsessed with that. I'm always looking for like patterns or concepts within a move that applies to more what's up and is down in jujitsu. So if you can recognize the concepts and those patterns, I think that's going to go much longer because you'll be able to problem solve and troubleshoot on your own. You won't always need a coach. You, one of the best things I did was I had a, there's another school owner that um, years ago we started, we had like a little, uh, we would partner up on the weekends and it's like forming like a mastermind. We would both agree to work on a Kimura. You know what I mean? And we would just drill it with each other. We would go live. And we would take a deep delve into the Kimura for like two or three months at a time. You know what I mean? And it wasn't just like learning how to do setups or whatever. It's like, put me in the Kimura. Let's roll from here 30%. And we put so much time into it. And every three months or so, we would like do a different module. And to me, it was like, like we had this mastermind. When I wasn't with him, he was looking up stuff. I was looking up stuff. We'd come together. We'd collaborate and be like, check this out. Check, ooh, let's try this. And those have been my biggest growth spikes ever. So, it, but again, it's, it's kind of like going back to a concept more than just like drilling an arm bar over and over, if that makes sense. So if, you can't, if, if I, I feel like if I could have thought like that way back when, I would be so much further ahead now. That's, that's kind of how I've been feeling lately. Remember I talked about it. I feel like we have so much and well for me anyway so much in my brain right now because we're learning so many techniques and really i still just want to work on some of the ones that we learned at the beginning and just master them and not move on until i feel like i have a better understanding of those speaking of concepts and stuff like that when a lot of people start as white belts you know they instantly gravitate towards like instructionals or youtube or something like that do you think that's a a detriment for them to kind of feed their brain even though they're hungry right they they want to keep learning do you think that's filling necessary space for other techniques that they should be learning if they're out doing their own research or do you think any any growth is going to be good for them at the beginning 
Yeah, again, it, it's kind of hard because I've seen some students that it does hurt, and then I've seen other students come in and be like, "Hey, check this out! I just learned this on YouTube." I'm like, "Okay," and they pull it off. Like they they just they can like that works for them. You know what I mean? So again, maybe it goes back to like learning how you learn. If you could kind of reflect upon that on yourself, peel back layers. Maybe your coach helps you with that. But discovering what what really helps you instead of uh, what is that Russian proverb? It's like you can't you can't chase two rabbits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I haven't heard that. I'm gonna have to look that one up. That's gonna well, go I mean, in. Maybe they're going the, the same direction. What? Yeah. What if? <laughs> unless yeah, unless, unless you heard, unless you heard it both in both the same. I got, direction. I got a dog down there. It's turning. <laughs> <up. laughs> hey, uh, one question also that I I've been wanting to do more. I want to get a person's perspective on their belt at at each level. And uh, so what what does it mean to be a black belt in your eyes? Like, because I feel like this is kind of a subjective thing and. That's what makes it such an interesting question to me. Is like I want to know what everyone feels like their role in their rank is. So, what does it mean to be a black belt to you? Well, do you mean like uh, like your knowledge, or because like coming from a traditional martial arts background, I feel like I would say something different than yeah. I mean, just like whatever comes to mind. Like, do you feel like it's a certain amount of technique? Is it a leadership position? Like, should you? Is it a combination of both? You know what I mean? Like, what what do you feel like is what sets a black belt apart from, say, you know, a very experienced brown belt? Yeah, you know, I think it's your your principles and your uh, your your found the foundation of your principles are just driven in so deep that you don't you don't break them. You know, and this can be metaphorically like you don't break your moral compass in certain things, or you don't break the rules on you know, uh, when you're going, throwing our arm bar on the mount, one of the biggest mistakes is like when people throw the arm bar, they let their butt hit before the leg goes over the head. Right. If you know what I'm talking about, you see white belts do that all the time. They sit and throw the leg over from mount and they lose the arm bar inevitably, but that can never happen to a black belt because that principle of always stepping the foot over the head, then sitting their butt down, it's driven so deep that you wake them up out of bed 3 a.m. in the morning, you know what I mean? You're like, do an arm bar on me. Like, they're, they're never going to not do that because the principle is so well-driven. So I, I would say just, you know, the principles of jiu-jitsu should be like that. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to beat every other black belt, but that uh, that should ne- that should never um, – I'm losing the word there. <laughs> you know what I mean? But never waver. Never yeah, waver. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like – it's like it's your – you you live it right. It's kind of like a weightlifter can pick up an empty barbell and lift it the same way as they they do it uh, with their one rep max. Right. right. It's just intrinsic to them. Like it right. is it is muscle memory. They know they know exactly how it's supposed to feel and and what it's supposed to look like and not right. It's kind of like the same aspect. So, but John, you got anything else, man? You know, I just got one question. Uh oh. No, this is some, <laughs> something I've noticed over the years, and I've only competed once. Um, but I think it's um. I think it's uh, almost a disservice. I don't know how it is in, in your academy, but it feels like a lot of the jiu-jitsu is always starting sitting, and I feel like I'm missing something by not starting standing. The only times we'll really start standing is if there's a, a tournament coming up. We might stand for a week prior to that to like get ready for it, and I just feel like uh, it's almost like a little bit of a disservice with how much we start sitting. I wish we started more standing. Do you Do you see anything with that? Yeah, you know, I th- it's weird because like a lot of people will argue it's safer to start on the knees because less people will get injured with takedowns. But when you step, it's like one of those things that's said that people then their students will say and yeah. other students will say. But look at how many wrestling programs are going on all over yeah, the world right now. That's true, and they all start on their feet. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, they're hard, hard <laughs> going for takedowns every day at practice. Yeah. And of course, people get hurt. But I mean, if it was really that dangerous, would wouldn't there be something? To, like all throughout high schools, middle schools, collegiate levels, like some epidemic of injuries all the <laughs> yeah. time to wrestlers. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? And there's not. So it's probably just because, again, I hate to say it, but like maybe the coach does is, doesn't like takedowns or they're just not, you know what I mean? I, I don't, again, it comes from the leadership, the culture. Yeah. And I've been to several schools, you know, I travel a lot and it's, it's pretty much been the same everywhere I've been. It's just always starting sitting and, and I get it. Yeah. It's just, um, I don't know. I guess, I feel like maybe as you've done it for a couple of years, it just makes more sense to start standing. 
but that's just me. I think a lot of things too is like we don't have a lot or like the most space in the world, you know. So it kind sure. of like if you're going for like a sick double leg or single leg, like it's kind of the people around you too. But if it's like four or five people on the mat, I'm like, all right, we can start standing. <laughs> <laughs> but when it's like take down class, I'm like, ah. I'll go ahead, just uh, maybe skip that one or, or <laughs> go a little bit easier because I ain't trying to hurt myself. <laughs> yeah, Until you go compete. I, I suppose maybe maybe the flip side would be that 80 to 90% of the jiu-jitsu you learn is on the ground. Like 80 to 90% of our art is on the ground, right? So so the flip side to it could be like, okay, let's get to the important stuff in a sense. Like, And that's not me saying it's important, but you know what I mean? It's in some people's eyes that – you're on the ground. We're doing jiu-jitsu now. That's what we're here for. Yeah, John Danny here talks about that, right? The One of the first goals of jiu-jitsu, that when you're applying it, is to get the person to the ground, right? Because then they can't utilize mm -hmm. their legs, one of the most powerful parts of someone's body, right? But uh, learning how to get them there is – you can't. it's not like you're going to be like, hey, can you fall to the ground? I need you to <laughs> – you still got to right. learn how to get them there. <laughs> so, but hey, James, man, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was fantastic. I think you put out a lot of good information and motivation for people out there that might be struggling and maybe hearing what you have to say will motivate them to keep going and, and focus on what, what is truly important. So we, we greatly appreciate that. John, you got anything? No, man. Thank you. Yeah. So remember guys, go ahead. Uh, Oh, James. Also, you want to throw out all your social media out there. So uh, people, if they want to find you, where, where, where can they find you at? Yeah. Uh, Instagram team, James O'Connor, BJJ, if you, that, that same team, James O'Connor, BJJ, you'll find on a bunch of them. So look that up. You should be able to find me. No problem. And you also have a blog post or a, a blog that you write also. Yeah, I have a WordPress one. I think it's the same no. thing. <laughs> just, <laughs> just Google I try that. To make it the same on just everything. So. Team O'Connor, BJJ, everywhere, and then you'll find them TikTok and all that. Team, stuff. team James yeah, O'Connor. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Well, James, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you guys for listening at home. And remember, no oil checks here. Loose. All right, guys. Thanks. Oh, I just hit my mic up. A